Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Avery Digital Classroom. My name is Darren Lee Calhoun II, and I am the Public Program and Outreach Coordinator here at the uh, Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture. I am elated, excited. I have you know, many of adjectives to toss out um, to present to you to tonight's event featuring our newest Executive Director, Dr. Tamara T. Butler. Um, she has a long list of achievements that, and we're just glad to have her back down here uh, at the Avery Research Center and hit back in Charleston. Um, as you will see through her bio, she's native born. She is um, Charleston's own, and we're glad to have her back. Um, as for the Avery, again, we have we are remaining closed to, for tours uh, for the time being. We will not allow anybody inside the building until it's safe for us to be uh, to do so. Um, our most important commodity is our community, as you will see through the um, presentation that we have tonight with Dr. Uh, with Dr. Butler. But we will not put anybody in harm's way. So until it is safe for us to do so, that's uh, that's we will be remain closed. And when we can, we will have a major celebration coming up. Um, also, we have uh, another event coming up on September 23rd with uh, Elena Beverly, who's a political st uh, st uh, strategist, strategist as well as uh, a former member of the Obama administration, who will be looking at the intersections of politics and of uh, politics as well as um, uh, politics and social justice. So um, just look up on the Avery social media pages for the links to that event. We'll be doing that in conjunction with the Bully Pulpit at the College of Charleston. Um, I'm excited, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, I, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, on a personal note, I remember during her interviews, Dr. Butler, within the first 10 minutes, I knew she was going to be our next uh, executive director. And that says a lot. So I, I, I'm excited about this talk tonight. I'm excited about her tenure here at the College of Charleston and at the Avery Research Center. And I look forward to each one of you meeting her socially distant as well as uh, through Zoom and everything else. But um, I, I look forward to everyone meeting her and being able to um, uh, to interact with her and, put, and giving her feedback of where you feel as if the Avery need, should go within the next five to 10 years. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and read her bio and I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Tamara Butler. <clears throat> Dr. Tamara T. Butler is the Executive Director at the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture. She's also Associate Dean of Strategic Planning and Community Engagement at the College of Charleston Libraries and an Associate Professor. She is a first-generation college graduate who earned her Bachelor of Science from Xavier University of Louisiana, HBCU prior all day. She holds, mass she holds a master's degree in African American Studies, African American and African Studies and Education, as well as a PhD in Education from the Ohio State University, that school down there. As a doctoral student, she learned a great deal about the importance of community and mentoring networks and cultivating new voices among scholars of color, uh, color fellows. Therefore, she dedicates her time to initiatives and organizations that center equity and social responsibility in education and community engagement. Previously, she served as a member of the Women of, uh, Women of Color Initiatives at the college, uh, Michigan State. Currently, she is a member of English Language Arts Teachers, uh, Teacher Educators Executive Committee. So without further ado, I give to you our great Executive Director. Let me get it pulled up. There we go. Our great Executive Director, Dr. Tamara T. Butler. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, if anybody knows uh, Mr. Calhoun, it really pained him to say the Ohio State. But you know, sometimes those Michiganders, you just got to say what you got to say. You got to recognize greatness when you can. Um, so I want to thank you all for tuning in. Um, hopefully, I won't keep you too long, um, but hopefully this will be a chance to learn a little bit about my research, about me and the vision that I have for Avery. It's still developing. so. Um, I want to start here with this image. It's the, the background photo is my great grandmother, Ollie Michael Bunno. Um, her children and grandchildren, uh, nieces, nephews, extended families share stories um, about how she created and continues to sustain community. Um, I see their stories through her stories. I learn about intergenerational collaboration, dialogue, care, 
and criticality as interlocking principles and methods to building and sustaining community. So with this talk, my hope is that you'll get to see a little bit about how my um, Johns Island community has really informed me and influenced uh, my work. So next slide. Also, I'm going to put that out there that if you see at the top, you see the at Defiant Tam and Avery tweet. So if you are on the Twitter sphere or anywhere, uh, please go ahead and add us and you know, live tweet is, is great. It also gives us a chance to see some of your feedback. Um, so in their 2016 piece, Reaching to Offer, Reaching to Accept, Allison Guest and Mr. Get Smith, as well as Eve Tuck, open with the assertion that from our vantage points, Land is a Black co-conspiring internal ancestor supporting life and freedom. At the same time, in the Black and African diaspora, Indigenous people make ancestral and sovereign relationships to that self-same land. So before entering this evening's conversation, I want to start with a reflection on what are our responsibilities as we live, work, and build on self-same land. In offering land acknowledgments, we make an outwardly commitment to respect the desires and to recognize the ancestral, traditionals, and contemporary stewards of the land. Um, as Dylan Miner, he is now full professor and director of American Indian and Indigenous Studies at Michigan State, writes, quote, these acknowledgments, however, must pre be preceded by relationships with living Indigenous peoples, communities, and nations. This declaration must then be followed with ongoing commitments to these same communities, land acknowledgments are a responsibility, end quote. So such manifestations, manifestations of this responsibility is to engage with those who are thinking about and writing intentionally about our relations, especially relationships between Black, Indigenous, Black Indigenous, and people of color communities. Also, what might the links be between hashtag land back and the land where you stand? I'm forever grateful to Dylan Miner, Estrella Torres, Andrea Riley Mukovitz, Eve Tuck, Allison Guess, Lee Miracle, Hannah Sultan, Mr. Get Smith, and several other scholars from whom I continue to learn. Next slide. So since the College of Charleston does not have a formal land acknowledgement, um, I'd like to pause and offer one here. So this evening, I acknowledge that the College of Charleston and the Avery Research Center occupy the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of Kasawa people, including the Ashpool, Kombi, Kusa, Edisto, Etwan, Kiwa, Stono, Wando, and Wimby. So the Wasama tribe of the Vernatown Indians who are now residing in Somerville, who traveled along the Cherokee path to Charleston. Some of those communities have helped and continue to help us understand the land on which we live. This acknowledgement also calls us and the college to recognize, support, and advocate for sovereignty of federally recognized nations for historic indigenous communities in South Carolina, for indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. This evening, I hope we will walk away thinking about our own relationships to land, as well as our relations and responsibilities to one another. So next slide. So I find myself working in a scholarly in-between place. Um, I like to invite you on a journey through a few um, different locations. So Johns Island taught me to be an interdisciplinary scholar. I came to understand footpaths as spaces to work in, as well as channels to move through and across. Relatives, mentors, and colleagues offered me interlocking principles that I adapted as a scholar working in and between English education and African American and African studies. Principles that bring us closer to equity, which include intergenerational collaboration, dialogue, sustainable practices of self-care and collective care, and a heightened awareness to act, respond, serve. So we're gonna travel through a few footpaths uh, toward co-producing knowledge at building and dreaming of communities. Next slide. So I find myself um, working through a couple different things. So if you've been out to Johns Island, you may recognize some of these images. So this one in particular is thinking about the Black Land Project. So at the time when I started this project, it was the community where my family lives was uh, experiencing development. So it's now um, near Kiwa Island's newest uh, Kiwa River. And you find that Johns Island has been written in these different kinds of ways as a place of vast development. 
So I constantly ask the question of what happens when we put this kind of marketing of the sea islands as a place for development up against um, these kind of narratives of community histories. And so the image in the bottom corner is from my family's collection. So it is the crew of families that live um, in the Mullet Hall community and they're standing outside of a uh, Hebron Presbyterian Church. So next one, please. So welcome to the Black Girl Land Project. Um, I consider it, according to a colleague of mine um, who read through my project, a radical archive praxis. So I'm deeply grateful to Yamaida Figueroa, whose book will be coming out soon. So um, she's really taught me a lot about how to think about my own work. And so it's a five year project interested in black women's connections to and conceptions of land. The picture at the top is um, in my aunt's studio in Queens. I have no idea how old I am, but I know that she's one of the first women um, to really introduce me to a love of plants and the ability to grow plants um, outside of the South. Um, and so the project is indebted to the work of Mr. Get Smith, the co-founder of the Black Land Project. It's a research project, it's a course, it's a personal commitment to communities and families like mine. The first component is a radical archive project. It's a blend of oral histories and black women's ephemera. So it's a little bit of mine, some community members um, and collections to visualize the projects, um, to visualize different linkages. The image in the bottom is a shirt that I kind of designed and turned into a logo. And it comes from cloth that has been gifted to me by one of the women that I interview. And so I think about how researchers and writers come to engage with the islands, almost as archaeologists, interested in studying human history through the excavation of sites, analysis of artifacts. Um, one summer, I got a chance to spend time at the Schomburg, and I realized that it's a lot of piecing together of Black women's lives. And so the archives actually pointed me back to a more radical um, archive that was under my nose. Next slide. Um, and so this is an image of my mother's hands. Um, photograph was taken by a colleague at Michigan State, Pete Johnston, who helped tell the story of the kind of work that I was doing. And so I overlay it with this really beautiful quote from Elsa Barkley Brown about how her mother and other mothers have really influenced how we think about history and the kinds of ways they teach us to become um, historians and scholars. And so with this lens, I turned to my mother's collection for insight on how we can and why we hear the stories, the people and live realities of Black families on Johns Island. She's holding a photograph of um, an arch, um, a window in the Hebrew church as it was being renovated. And so these are kind of her collections of photographs. Um, and so I pieced together a couple of different things from her collection. She really has been, though not formally trained, she's really been a person that taught me exactly what Elsa Barkley Brown said, which was to ask the right questions. So next slide. So looking at her collection, these are her books. Um, my mother has been a kind of informal historian. And I realized while lots of individuals lean heavily on the, the visual work of Julie Dash, that really Gloria Naylor um, and other writers were kind of my first encounter. This is her book that actually belongs to a cousin um, that she borrowed. And then there's um, all these different books that she acquired about John's Island. And thinking about what does it mean for her, who's a woman who's lived on John's Island, to collect these stories and kind of reiterations of the island that other people have created. And so for me, it's the book at the bottom that's actually one of the most influential um, it's Ain't You Got a Right to the Tree of Life by Guy and Candy Carowin. And it's really thinking about how the community members are, sh how those kind of stories come to the forefront and bubble up. Um, but also it raises a question about like, what would the Ain't You Got a Right to the Tree of Life look like if it was published by the people who live there? Like, would it still have the same kind of appeal? What would be some of the organizing of the stories? And so that was one of the questions that I raised um, and one of the things that I'm looking at. And so, Next slide. So this is also part of her collection. So I took the Ain't You Gotta Write to the Tree of Life and I thought about these other iterations and connections across her collections. And one of them is the presence of the prevalence of trees. 
She has we have a heavy collection of family reunion stuff. Um, she also collects lots of um, newspaper articles that's really talking about development over the years, probably over the last 20, 30 years. And so what I'm what has taught me is how to read towards home. I think there's these really large narratives about South Carolina and about the sea islands that we find in literature, that we find in kind of the imagination and, and the way that we think about tourism. But what does it look like when we actually listen to the people on the ground who aren't at these very, um, very visible sites? So they're not at the angel oak tree or, you know, they're not at another historic site like Walnut Hill or they're not they're not in these very visible places that have historical markers. So how can we learn to read towards home? So for months, I've been eyeing my mom's collections. I've seen these before, um, and I've been tra tracing and tracking trees and roots in her archives. And so I'm thinking about it as a way to then um, talk about what other ways, what other women are talking and what have they, and what kind of work are they, are they doing? And so, it led me to a, another set of archives, um, which is here. Next slide. And so in an in interview I did um, with Miss Robinson, um, she towards the end of the story, she stopped. Uh, after we finished our interview, she stopped and she said, uh, she looked at the shirt she was wearing and she said, I want this to be a part of my story. And she said on, on the front of it, it's a picture of a child and an, and an elder and it's she said, you know, this is the youngest person in the family and this is the oldest person in the family. And this shirt was created by, you know, one of our blind relatives. And so what does it mean to say that this particular item is a part of how she wants to tell a story about herself? And so I thought about it in conjunction to all the others, all the other uh, family reunion shirts that I, we have. And so the top one is a family reunion shirt that I took some fabric that Ms. Robinson gave me and kind of thought about what would it look like to redesign the front um, in these kind of like patchwork quilts concept. Um, and so thinking about quilting and storytelling. And then of course, uh, the picture over in he, with me in the blue shirt is our family's very first family reunion um, where we have t-shirts and that kind of emblem carried on across about four or five family reunions. And so what does it mean for the kind of use of trees, the kind of use of different images? How do families use those to tell a story and lay claim to a place where we know that heirs property is an issue, development is an issue, um, relatives and elders pass on and become ancestors? Like how do we continue to, to mark our relationship to place? Next slide. So the other part of this that's been really exciting for me is I created this course called the Black Girl Land Project. It's an advanced African-American studies course, four years I've taught it. And what it helped me see was every time I taught it, living at the time in Michigan, um, students understanding um, a really powerful quote from Ravi Howard is, we are, we've, we're not urban people. We're all, we've always been rural people. We've always been connected to land. Um, we've never been disconnected from low country, from oaks, from trees. And so to have students think about their own kind of family's migration pattern in from the rural south or the west up into a place like Michigan or um, Ohio or Illinois, what does that mean? And what I found to be, at the time I was interested in black and indigenous relationships to land, but what I actually found was that students were more interested in thinking about like how they got there. It was like, oh my, you know, we have land in Mississippi or we have family in Alabama. And so what does that, what does that do? Mom, I had a very dynamic, uh, I had a student who had lost her grandmother the same year that she took the course. Um, and we got to talk to the author of Trace, Lorette Savoy. And she said, um, our, Lorette Savoy wrote about ecological footprint, but what ended up happening is she said, I don't want to think about that kind of footprint. She wants to think about like, our connection to land as an ecological footprint, how far as we migrate, how far do we get away from land? And so her idea was that her grandmother's footprint was the largest. And as they moved further and further north and farther and farther away from planting and agriculture that they felt that their footprint was getting smaller. And so her and the author had this dialogue. So for me, it's about giving students a variety of engagements, partnerships, 
um, with community organizations to think about these relationships and also for the students to get an opportunity um, to engage with black studies as a as a praxis, as a way of life. And so students got to present at conferences, students had opportunities to talk to scholars across different fields. So that was one of the things that I thought was really important that I'd like to continue here at Avery. Next slide. So one other community that I've learned a lot from is um, Puerto Rico. And so I have colleagues at Michigan State, um, Afro-descendant Puerto Ricans, non-Afro-descendant Puerto Ricans. And so post Maria um, in 2018, so six months after Hurricane Maria really ravished um, the country of Puerto Rico, it we decided to travel um, about eight of us, six uh, faculty members and two graduate students to the island and we went, we traveled across the island. We partnered with Festival de la Palabra, um, which was an on the ground um, literary organization that held a conference and offered kinds of classes and just talked to people um, as we distributed whatever goods people needed um, and really talking to them about what do you want people to know about your experience. And as a young person who left New Orleans in college from Katrina, um, who was in Charleston during Hugo, um, to hear people tell stories on different parts of the island, it was it was um, saddening, but it was also a reminder that we're not that far apart from each other. The kinds of experiences that we have around hur hurricanes, or hurricanes, so around hurricanes, um, and so that project really helped me think about a different kind of archive because one of the things that the that the individual shared we really wanted to focus on afro-descended communities so when we we're in louisa is, is one people wanted to say that we haven't talked about the hurricane since it happened and this is six months um we come together we have we have food we see each other but we do not talk about what we just went through and so what does that mean to kind of create this this collection of stories where people are talking about something for the first time. So that was a, a powerful moment for me and to think about cross college collaboration, um, cross nation collaboration, um, and really thinking about what does it mean to tell stories in a way that can then be used to make a, tr to change and offer transformation. So of course, um, what does all of that have to do with Avery, right? And so for me, it's there's a beautiful quote from if we're going to think about the Caribbean from scholar M. Jackie Alexander, where she says that vision helps us um, remember why we do the work. And so this is an image um, that is officially 100 years old. So 1919, uh, the class of 1919 outside of Avery. And so remembering what Avery was created to do. Next slide. And so for me, it was it was always a hub um, over the years, over its tenure of a, to being critical, to helping critical educators um, really get their grounding. And so the fact that you're training people here in Charleston to then become educators who for the most part have a national impact, but really have a, a local focus um, is, is key. And so if we remember why we do the work, we do the work because that's what Avery was created to do. It was created to create, to have transformative educators, um, specifically black educators. Um, and what does that mean to, to feed into, funnel, support, offer the resources to a community that's been disenfranchised? And so there's some statistics here about, these are some numbers, but I really think these numbers are rather low compared to what I hear on a regular about what Avery and who Avery serves. And so to think about if we were to say that 3,000 patrons is who Avery serves annually, um, now that we're in a now that we're in COVID era, I'm pretty sure that number has has expanded even more because people are tuning into the digital classrooms, people are tweeting and reaching out and part and still wanting to do partnerships. And so for us, it's remembering that Avery has always been an education site. It's an archive, it's a museum, it's a gathering space that I know people are really like chomping at the bits to get into, but can't come in yet, <laughs> but we will get there. And so just thinking about that as well. And so the second half of uh, M. Jackie Alexander's quote is on the next slide, which is 
Um, practice is the how, and it makes change and grounds the work. And so thinking about, this is an image of three educators, um, three teachers on the steps of Avery. And so for me, it's thinking about what the practice is going to be. We know that Avery is important. The building behind it will be on everybody's radar. So just saying, <laughs> if you see it in this image, 123 Bull Street, put it in your, <laughs> put, make a note because it's going to come back again. And so thinking about how we have teachers um, and what are the kinds of things that they did and now thinking about what can we do? And so here's a couple things that I offer. I actually borrowed this from Vincent Brown um, on the next slide. So when we shift our emphasis from historical recovery to rigorous and responsible creativity, we recognize that the archives are not just the records bequeathed to us by the past. Archives also consist of the tools we use to explore it, the vision that allows us to read its signs, the design, that and design decisions that communicate our his, our sense of history's possibilities. And so the pictures on the left again are from my family. They love when I just go in the photo album when everybody's asleep. Um, and so thinking about how we can, there's something that Avery is unique in that it's a, it was an education space turned museum, turned archive, turned gathering space. And so to think about what that means is it, uh, it already has embedded in it this idea that is teaching us how to use the archive. It's teaching us how to engage the archive. It's teaching us what does it mean to engage with history in a present sense. And so for me, I think there's a couple things that I wanted to that I want to pull out from Vincent Brown's work to guide how we're going to continue. Um, that's going to continue how I work with Avery. So next slide. And so in the short term, as Darren mentioned at the beginning, I'm looking for listening sessions. Um, I, I can't do what I do without this team. Um, this they have been really <laughs> there's nothing more stressful than trying to come in and herd cats. And so this team is not that <laughs> they are. Um, everybody's aware of their roles and they're also very much about working together. And so my thing is not to necessarily interrupt this year, but to really support the continued programming that they have planned. Think alongside, I mean, we have phenomenal staff, faculty, and even more phenomenal students. The kinds of things that the students are working on blows my mind. And I'm like, OK, um, so <laughs> just tell me, just tell me how we want to pull this off. And thinking about an internal tune up, I think Avery has, folk, has operated in the minds of others and community members as a liaison. It's also the place I don't know where anything black is, so I'm going to stop by Avery. I also want to research. I may have a great grandmother that lived here. I want to find her. So it's all of these different things, and I think our team has is equipped to do all of them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to do everything. And so for internal tune up is really trying to get my team to take some of their hats off um, and hoping that the community will help me honor that. Um, as well as trying to make sure that we're efficient. And so thinking about as you as you're thinking about funding and offering resources, how can we use them strategically to do a couple of different things? One is investing in the archives. Um, and that's not just collecting things because it, the more that you drop off at our doorstep, we don't have space. <laughs> so the more space we need. And so investing also means we have to acquire space. There's also a professional development. Our archivists are fantastic. Um, our students are too, but as the students roll out, we still want to keep making sure that our that our archivists are up, are up to speed and that they're able to bring others up to speed. Investing in educators, so we're looking at partnerships with K-12 teachers and also anyone who considers themselves an educator, a public historian. So how can we help you um, really enrich your understanding of history and what we have in the archives? to really broaden and maybe even deepen is what I'm looking for, um, how you approach history, um, history and culture here in South Carolina. And then, of course, I love artists. I'm not an artist, but I would love to see more artists in the building. And so how can we make that happen? And then investing in lifelong learners. We know that the Avery Institute came about because alum had a vision. Um, and the vision was that um, whether or not the center continued to be a place that trained teachers, it was a place where people feel like they could always get an education and gain knowledge. And so for us, we want to continue to 
Um, think about how the teachers that we work with and artists and others can host co-host workshops. But also we want to think about bringing those national conversations and international conversations to Avery. Um, because our doors have been closed, we didn't really get a chance to hang out with the Sala or have a Sala hang out with us, the Association for the um, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Um, shout out to Carter G. And so thinking about that, like what would it look like for these large conferences to come and feel as though they can fit, they can wedge into Avery, but also so that we can have them interface with community members. And I want to thank Cameron Wilder for sending this photo to us. Um, we appreciate it. It's a is one of my favorite of the of the ones he sent. So thank you, Cameron, for sharing that with us. And so I close with this question. So me and my Fisher Price lawnmower. <laughs> if you see my family's yard, that Fisher Price lawnmower did nothing except blue bubbles um, and allow me to play in the grass. But how will you help us cultivate? Right. So I ask that you share your I, your thoughts and with us on social media. But I also ask that you, you know, think about it, hold on to them and be ready. Get your notepads out for when we have listening sessions. Um, I've gotten phone calls and emails with people having ideas and those are great, um, but it's really trying to figure out how we can strategically bring them to the team and think through what they will look like, because I think everybody has ideas. Um, my favorite thing that I that I heard came from the late Dr. Frank W. Hale um, from Ohio State, who the cultural center is named after. He said commitment without capital is counterfeit. And so my hope is that if you're thinking about bringing ideas to the table that you find that you help us think about how we can also fund those ideas, um, because Avery is um, a corner um, of the library, but we're also a cornerstone of, of thinking about black history here in the community. So how can we make sure that that um, that that continues? We need dollars. <laughs> so if you can help us think about that too, that'd be great. So thank you so much. I say I appreciate that, Dr. Butler. Um, as you all can see, this is one of my favorite people in the world right now. <laughs> so um, we're going to go ahead and move into question and answer now. But um, I want to toss something at you real quick. So you talked, you were really talking about um, one of the pieces, uh, one of your slides, you talked about, you know, that reverse migration coming back home. You know, um, of course, I'm a Calhoun. I went up to uh, my family through the Great Migration, found their way up to Detroit as many families have found their ways and somehow I found my way back here in Charleston. Um, can you give us a little bit about your experience coming home and being home at the Avery? Yeah, I mean the 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 being home part I meant to, I had a slide about that and I actually put it away. Being home, um, a thing happened <laughs> and it um, I drive by my elementary school a lot. So my family still lives on Johns Island, so I usually go see my family often. Um, sometimes I think I live there um, and and I drive by my elementary school and then one day I got an email from the from from the per, from the writer at the Post and Courier, Jenna, and she said, your kindergarten teacher, your teacher reached out to us. Do you recognize this person? And I was like, that's my kindergarten teacher. <laughs> and I just thought about her. I mean, I've also received mail from um, my computer teacher from elementary school. And so there's something about coming back home that's been refreshing. It's been great to know I still have support team here and a support system here. Um, it's also knowing that I have a responsibility. So coming back home, um, because I never left, I've, I've come home, even though I've lived outside of South Carolina since 2002 um, and again in 2007, um, I haven't, I never left. I'm here every summer. And so to know that I'm perm that I'm like you know permanently or like grounded here, is 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 change is life changing and to do it at at the Avery is even more exciting, because now it's not just about like stopping by and putting my hand in the archives, but it's also about knowing that we have the I have the chance to to think about programming and partnerships and initiatives that allow us to really change this place, um, and so I'm very excited about that particular opportunity. Absolutely. And um, and even connecting with that, uh, one thing that you said back during when you were trying to, when you uh, during your uh, visits on campus or whatnot, you were saying how you want the community to make this their home again. You know, this is the, the, the Avery Research Center is home to 
the people of Charleston. So, um, you know, we're connecting that, bringing everyone back into the building, um, making this your space. Um, so can you talk a little, bit, a little bit about how, you know, this is the people's space um, and having how, you know, how they can use us as a resource for when they want to uh, figuratively come home, not uh, literally yet. <laughs> Yeah, not literally. We don't come yet. Um, but I think you we want us to imagine it as a different kind, as as an intergenerational space. I know in the past we've had really great connections with the Black Student Union. Um, when thinking about so thinking about students, thinking about people who would just drop by with their family, and so for me, I wanted to feel like home in the sense that it's not just the place where you lay to rest your family's archives, but I want you to think about a a gathering space. Um, really in the sense of how could, who would you like to bring here, right? So think of it like that, like if, if imagine, imagine, now don't run away with this idea, but imagine that Avery is kind of like a guest house, right? And if you could bring a scholar, an artist, um, a creative, an educator to the space because you wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one or you work with a community of young black, black girls or black boys, or just young people, and you're like, I want them to be in conversation with this person um, or these people, right? Like, what would that look like? And so how could Avery help you do that? Knowing that, I think the one thing about that we often miss, and I want people to think about this, is Black communities, especially on the Sea Islands, really believed in co-ops. And so the thing was, is that they would help when they could, but they also recognized that it was like matching funds. And so for us, it's like, come to us with an idea bring your ideas to us and i want you to feel like it's a place where you can come it's also a place where you can invite people and we can meet in the middle so i'm looking forward to um like i'm just looking forward to all the different iterations of that and so to think about it as home i, I mean you know i would love for us to get i don't know do the kids even say this anymore i'm looking forward to us getting some swag right so what would it look like for us to have something that says you know we are avery I am Avery, and what does that look like? Um, so just thinking about that, so that when you walk around, people know um, you belong to Avery, and Avery is a part of you. Um, and that's the kind of that's the kind of feeling that I think you know. If you know anything about Charleston, they'd be like, "Who your people is?" Um, and so we want to we wanted to feel that way that like Avery is your people, and you're our people. So, yeah. And that. Great. That actually leads into two questions that we have that we can actually combine together. Um, one but, uh, from the great Ruth Rambo, as well as uh, another question that we had come through. How can people support the uh, upcoming programming of Avery? And um, what do you see as uh, the opportunities for people being able to actually volunteer at the Avery? Ooh, well, um, right now we're closed. So <laughs> that's the hardest part. I think we're really looking at, so there's something that we're working on right now. I'm very excited when you have an, when you have expertise in the building that you didn't even know was there. So Erica Veal um, and working with Darren is thinking about we're getting a garden. So we'd love to partner with folks. I know um, that there are some, we have some farmers and some gardeners in the community. So things that allow us to be outside, I would love to have that. That would be um, one thing I would I would definitely like to see. Um, and then also thinking about volunteering at the Avery may look, it's going to look a little different. I think we're looking for, um, and it's something I need to talk more with the archival staff, but you know, people need, we need you to do the stuff on the front end before you drop your, archive, your stuff off. So we need people to help with the cataloging, those kinds of things. Also people who will be willing to kind of talking with Darren and, and Courtney about co-hosting digital classrooms. So what kind of things do you want to continue to see? Those are also helpful and also getting the word out. So even if you share, share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, Avery needs funds to do all the really dope things that they got coming down the pipeline. Um, and so for us, I want us to be, I want you to be able to do that. That's the kind of, um, that's the kind of things that we're looking for, like foot soldiers, people who are willing to get out and say, hey, you know, Avery's a great place. How can we help you? If you have a if you have a resource, if you are great at grant writing or you are good at stuffing envelopes, please let us know. <laughs> we're looking for all of those things. Um, and we're also looking for people who are willing to share their expertise. 
um, especially because one of the things that we want to do and Avery's been always good at is highlighting national scholars, but we really want to highlight local scholars, local activists, local experts as well. Did that answer the question? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to pull a question from the chat we have here. In your thoughts about common narratives around experiences such as hurricanes, is your hope to bring back an indigenous communities from different places to share stories of relationships to land and displacement? within the context of climate change and current moment and strategies for success of, the, of those peoples and their stories and connection to place surviving and, th and transforming the future of this place? This feels like a conference question. I've <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, feel like, I was like, which scholar put this question in there? Um, and so I, my hope is to bring back, com is to bring communities from different places in conversation. So that was one of my focus at my larger, I kind of took it, I made a reference to it, but I kind of took it out, thinking about black archipelagos. And so what does it mean, for example, how can we have a conversation? What would it look like to talk about Maori people in New Zealand? Or what would it look like to talk about um, people in Puerto Rico? What would it look like to talk to some of our brethren in Barbados? Trinidad, Tobago. Uh, so just thinking about, I'm interested in islands because I think while we can talk about displacement in a variety of places, so we can talk about indigenous displacement right here in the sea islands, right? Because I think um, I'm probably gonna get myself in a sticky spot, but I think there's like a claim of Gullah Geechee as indigenous, but we also remember there's people here at, a, alongside us, right? So how do we have a conversation about those communities and where they are, where those indigenous um, communities are and may, may be located. And so I'd love to talk to, to islands in particular because there's something about geographical location, um, the actual physical, like what does it mean to be an island that may be connected to or very far away from mainland? Um, what does that look like? And how, our lo how those are maybe run parallel. And I think it can help us develop strong, really dynamic strategies. For one example, when we were in Puerto Rico, we went um, into the mountains and to see the kind of community that are trying to rebuild this site um, in terms of a place to, to actually grow food. So house people who will then allow be able to keep that kind of place intact, but also be able to serve the larger community. We see that kind of um, that similar kind of structure here in South Carolina but the organizations that were supporting it have struggled. And so what kind of strategies can we come up with that would allow us to think about what are the things that make us similar as islands, but also what are the things that make us different? That's great. Um, another question we have coming from the chat, what do an ideal partnership with other academic pro uh, departments and programs at the college look like? Money. <laughs> no, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I mean, the thing is, it, an ideal partnership would be that you come with an idea and that we can match funds, right? Because I think that's usually where we struggle, um, or at least that you come with enough funds to support a chunk of the idea. Um, one of the things that we learned, and I learned this especially at Michigan State, is it's, it's really great to get a commitment from departments and, and centers to say, you know, this is the thing we will support and try to make us a budget line item. Like Avery doesn't move. <laughs> we don't, we're not going anywhere. We're the building, you know, 125 Bull Street is there and we're gonna have programming. And so for us, it's not like some, it's not like other things that kind of shift and moved, but instead we're like, our programming is consistent. And so if you see where there's a parallel, then let us, let us talk about it. I mean, ideal partnerships are one where it's like, you know for a fact you wanna talk about race. You know for a fact you want to talk about social justice. You know for a fact you want to talk about local, and that you know that your or that your um, talk is for a wide audience or whatever programming it is. And so, ideal partnerships for me are partnerships that are really like let's match funds, let's match up with the vision, let's match up with the mission of Avery. Um, I'm looking for partnerships that would really, if there's somebody who can help me work with teachers and not just in a like, oh, we're gonna throw you a book, but actually like, let's sit down and maybe think about how we can develop curriculum, right? Like I I get behind that and curriculum around social justice and race, especially anti-racism. Um, 
one thing that when I said that one person I actually do want to shout out is uh, Tamika Gadsden, who for, has helped us grow our followers <laughs> on social media. So we are indebted to you and I'd love to partner with you on your historically accurate anti-racist, uh, you know, book club. So just thinking about these kind of partnerships where people are doing things that are organic um, and that support the mission and vision of what we do. Absolutely. Um, we have a few more um, questions that we want to uh, definitely toss at you. Um, this is, feels like your, uh, your, your talk again over at the, when you were coming on. But um, and Simon asked this one about how um, how we how can the Avery can we build a, pl a place based curriculum that transform the ethos of the entire institution? Woo! <sighs> well, Simon. That's a good question. I'd love to change the ethos too, but we also know institutions are like, well, it's bad to use it in this sense because glaciers are move, are melting quickly, but institutions move at a glacial pace, right? We know that. And so I think if we want to, and if we want to do a place-based curriculum, then we, one thing we have to change is we have to change the, <laughs> we have to change the reliance of, of, hold on a second. So one of the things is that that I think will change the place base. Like if we think about place base, you're going to have to change how we think about curriculum. So it's going to have to require us to talk to community members and really think about what does it mean to work with community members and not just like, oh, you're my partner, hold my hand. But actually, how do we make sure you're compensated for your time, your connections, your networks? And so place based curriculum is is thinking about it's going to be intergenerational. Um, and it's going to require us to think with students who are here. It's going to require us to think with teachers, people's grandmama, the candy lady down the street. Everybody has to be in on this um, because then what it does is it then changes the way we think about who gets to teach. So who are your Gullah Geechee experts? Well, are those Gullah Geechee experts the professors on the Gullah Geechee class? Probably not, right? So how can you how can you do that? And I think that that's that's the change that we have to really pay attention to. If we want it to happen. All right, we got about three more questions. Uh, now, feel as if I saw one from Marvin, uh, our former director, uh, one of our former directors here at the Avery before. Um, but he wanted to see what a, what would our ideal partnership with the new International African American Museum I am would be, in your opinion. Our partnership is. I think our partnership is really coming to um, an a consensual understanding of who we are separately and then who we are together. So for me, it's got it's always going to be a question of, well, how is this going to how is this going to be um, recognizing that a that IAAM is a museum. It's a huge museum that has a really great spot. Avery is a little museum, right? But we also are an archive. And so recognizing for us an ideal partnership will look like talking about what, how are we going to reconcile our relationship with the archives? Because Avery has the materials, right? Like we have the we have the materials. A uh, IAAM also and Avery also have connections. So we want to make sure that our our connections that we have to community members are are ethical, um, that they're not exploitative. And once again, the same thing with as we talked about with the place base is that it's making sure that everybody gets <laughs> people get recognition for what they do and not just a footnote. And that's not just for a that's not just for IAM. That's for everybody who wants to work with Avery. Um, I think our partnerships is going to require us to sit at the table literally and say, what can Avery do and what can't Avery do? Because right now we are small staff um, and I think we're doing a lot of things. Um, one thing we're very good at. Um, <laughs> a little too good at is is networking and connecting people. I think we're we're really good at doing that. And so for me, I think an ideal partnership is going to require us to lay out clearly um, what each person, what each um, entity can bring to the table um, and how and what that's going to mean. Um, so yeah. Great. Um, and that, I'm going to make this a last question because uh, we have to go ahead and get out of here. But I have um, I'm going to try to connect these last two um, as far as like working with like different lenders and helping the native community. 
but also, um, you know, being able to connect different people, uh, you know, using Avery as a hub. How can we connect lenders, banks, even Avery and the college uh, funding to different um, black businesses? But then as we as you think about that, can you go ahead and uh, give a idea of what you have planned for 123 Bull Street? Uh, as we, as uh, Steve Osborne, our, our interim president uh, last uh, two years ago, said that we have our building back now as of 2018. I don't mind if I do. Um, so my thing is, I, I this is a, a thing that I will say. I want people to understand that I want 123 Bull Street to be the place to go like i think everybody loves our auditorium they love it they like to hang out there but i want it to be a place where we can really house artists um artists and residents so that we can start to have these partnerships with uh with iaam and with Halsey and other entities but i want people i want it to be like i'm thinking about for example i wanted to apply for a ford fellowship but things got a little complicated and so i know that with postdocs Postdocs needs a place to stay. So what would it look like if the if 123 Bull Street becomes a play, a site for artists and residents? It becomes a site for um, postdocs. It becomes a it has a studio space in it so that artists can actually have some place to work. Um, or we can negotiate that with our art uh, <laughs> with our, our folks in, in art. Um, but also for me, it's really thinking about it could be a meeting space. I wanted to ha have a space for students. Right now, our students don't really have an office. They kind of float. Um, but thinking about so that they can work and have the and close, lock the door and, and go and do whatever they need to do. So for me, I think it's really th it's really getting to a point where 123 Bull Street is just an extension of Avery. It's like really it's really the buzz, the buzz place. So it's like, yes, I love to still have events and all of our things in the in 125, but 123, I think, is where we want to have. We want to go back to its original um, its original purpose as a residence. A meeting space, a conference space um, would be really would be great because then it allows us to do more um, that so that we could actually maybe think about what it means to expand our archives and think about black businesses. Um, one thing I will say is I I really would like for for to invite people to the table to think about how we can start to function in ways that thinks about small grants that thinks about um really supporting so getting even the institution itself um if banks could help us think through what it looks like to invest in black businesses but also the fact of when our institutions have events how often are we actually supporting a black business a black owned business um, and especially with so many of them, we're losing some very quickly. Um, what does it look like to support those in our everyday um, endeavors? I'm trying to find the right noun. I think that's the one I was looking for. Um, so I would say we really, it's really for me, I was the question of how can you help Native community of Charleston? I'm willing to open up a listening session, but you literally have to listen banks and lenders have to listen to the people who live here and i can see not i don't want to do loans um i don't i don't like loans i don't think those are great ideas but i think in a way to say that we honor and we respect the kind of things that you would like to do here in charleston let's talk about grants let's talk about ways to support offer lines of credit that's something you that's something like i said i'm willing to i'm willing to make the space <laughs> we can we can create the space. Um, you just you know bring a listening ear, your notepad, and your checkbooks. And that I was literally about to just ask you that same thing. What can and this is the final question I, I promise. What can people do to help us? What can people do as far as giving, as far as you know helping out? What can they do to help the Avery move forward within your first five years? Please don't harass my staff. Um, like I, I think I think my staff keeps getting lots of emails and phone calls of people trying to get in touch with me. I got your message. I will get back to you. We're trying. I'm still trying to figure out how Avery runs because everybody's 
everybody things are moving smoothly. It's like I'm I feel like I'm in a relay race trying to catch the baton in this team. Um, so I would say if you want to support Avery, it's thinking about I really I really don't like meetings, but I don't like individual meetings. So I'll, I'll say that. So if you know that you and the and your organization and your friends organization and your church organization, like if you know that those are individuals who have an idea they want to rally around, put that together. Come to me, right? I'd rather it be that than you send one person and another person and another person. Don't stop my students on the street to be like, hey, you got Dr. Butler's phone number? Nope. So if you want to support Avery, I ask that you please um, really think about your own partnerships, like at least come with one or two, come with at least two people. And I like, I prefer to do meetings together. I like to do think tanks together. So that's one way to support. And the other way to support is really holding on to your, your dollars and thinking about how you can invest. You can even come together and say, you know, we'd actually like to support a scholarship. Um, we'd actually like to come together and support this event. We'd actually, we heard you all are doing um, partnering with a book club. We actually like to purchase a hundred books, right? Like those are the kinds of things because if not, then Avery has to say, okay, great. Um, we have this event, it costs a thousand dollars, but we only have fifty dollars. So how are we going to make this work? So for us, I think the way the best way to help Avery is to really think about how the how can your investments really move forward the mission, if that makes sense, right? So that's that's what I would ask. And like I said, if you have a question, I know everybody wants to talk to me because everybody has ideas they've been sitting on. Be on the lookout for the listening sessions. Uh, promote, promote, promote anything that Avery does. Um, and really, if there's a way that, like I said, if you can come to us in clusters, that would be great. Um, that'll that I would I would entertain cluster meetings more than I would entertain individual meetings because nobody likes to be on Zoom or. Microsoft, Microsoft Teams or FaceTime or any of it multiple times a day. So, yeah. Great. Well, Dr. Butler, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are overjoyed here at the Avery Research Center. We're here. Um, she's home and I want to welcome everyone home. Um, welcome home to the Avery. We are moving forward, onward and upward. Um, I have to give a special shout out to our uh, outreach coordinator, Miss Courtney Hicks, whose birthday is tomorrow. Um, also, I have to say after November, it will be very hard to get in contact with me. I'll be out on paternity leave, so call Courtney. I won't be here, <laughs> but um, no, seriously, I, I we we at the Avery really do appreciate all of you for coming out. We appreciate everyone for continuing to, to be with the Avery during this time of COVID and during this pandemic. And we always continue to, we always want to continue to serve each and every one of you and put on great programming. So again, if you want to donate to the Avery um, on your emails, you can see our donation button down at the bottom. If you want to uh, reach out to us, you can always catch us at our email address, averyprograms at cof, as in Frank, C edu. Um, and again, we look forward to cultivating this community and bringing everybody back home to the Avery Research Center. We are here for you and we hope you are there for us. So thank you and we'll talk to you soon. Peace.